Hey, how's it going? Hey, Brad, how you doing today, sir? Yeah, nice to meet you. Hey, likewise. Thanks so much for coming onto my channel today. This is a this is a real treat for me. Uh, how are things? Where are you Where are you located? Uh, I'm actually located in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, okay. just outside of it. Yeah, just been living and working in the area for about a decade, and fell into an obsession with boots. And uh, <laughs> and everybody's got everybody's got to have something, right? You know, like sometimes it's good that our vices are uh, healthy vices, right? Um, right? So everybody gets addicted to something. So it's you know. Yeah, it's a good thing to get addicted to. That's so true. You know, there are worse addictions like gambling and cocaine and things like that. So, yeah, right. There's the there's the extremes out there for sure. Definitely. definitely. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for tuning into my boot talk today. Joining me today is Brad Day, CEO and president of Helm Boots. I have a pair of Helm here. I just tried them out for the first time uh, last this month. I'm blown away by the quality, blown away by the look, the aesthetic, the build everything about it. I'm so stoked to finally get introduced to this brand and particularly the CEO behind it. So welcome, sir. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Well, thank you. It's excited to be here and thank you for the, the kind words and uh, always love getting feedback from people that kind of are experiencing the brand for the first time and, and what the feedback is. And, you know, we, we set out to build really great product and and don't cut any corners there and so it's it's nice to get some validation around that a little bit so thank you very much yeah absolutely my pleasure let's let's talk about you a little bit like your background i was researching you apparently you worked uh for adidas for like 16 years is that right yeah i did i uh i was lucky enough to get a job right out of right out of college with adidas and so kind of started entry level doing data entry it was a terrible job but yeah. at the time being a a collegiate soccer player we're going to work for Adidas was fantastic. You go play soccer at lunch and then spent the next 16 years kind of working around doing lots of different things. Spent four years over in Germany and found myself in San Diego uh, working in the golf division when Adidas owned TaylorMade at the time. And so kind of traveled all over the world working for Adidas, doing different things and building products and selling products. And it was, was fantastic. Met my wife there. My wife worked at Adidas for about 12 years. So it was a, uh, it was great. Loved the brand, loved the experience, got a lot out of it. So it was, it was, it was fun. Yeah. I'll say so. Well, you got to live in Germany for four years. <laughs> what was that like? It was great. I mean, I always say that if you're, it's such a, it's such a great country to live in as an expat. It's central Europe. So you're close to everything, right? You know, Prague, I mean, Paris, I mean, the Alps, I mean, everything's so close to Germany and the people are so friendly, it's clean, it's safe. And you do, you come to appreciate the efficiency of the Germans. Like, it's just, uh, it was uh, fantastic. I mean, saw Europe and then, you know, wow. traveled all over the world, really, when you know, being there, the, the global headquarters, right? You're you're working with the markets all over the world. And so spent a lot of time in, in South America and Asia and um, working with the markets there and got to see the world on somebody else's dime, which is a, which is a fun thing. Always a good thing for yeah. sure. Wow. That must have been an incredible experience. Did you pick up any German while you were there? I did. I, I spoke, I always, I use the term like bar German is kind of how it, it's. So I wasn't getting any, into any political conversations or anything like that, but I could speak yeah. fairly well when I left. Um, it's okay. kind of all gone now being back. And I think we've been back almost 12 years. So, which is kind of crazy to be, be back. Um, so don't have a lot of German, German left, but I think we're, the kids are old enough now. We're planning to head back maybe next summer and kind of show them around a little bit. Oh, wow. That is so cool. Wow. I would love that opportunity. Yeah. I've only, I only got to travel to Germany once. I was uh, just graduated high school. And so I did a sort of a European tour before <laughs> as sort of my send off. It's a beautiful place. It's just really fun being in a part of the world that, that that's that old, right? You, you know, yeah. the history of, just about everywhere you go over there is just, there's amazing stories and history of all, all of those countries. I loved kind of exploring and getting off the beaten path and getting out of the big cities and, um, you know, finding like the kind of the authentic experiences as you, as you tour around Europe is, was, yeah. it was once in a lifetime and you yeah. never know, maybe find ourselves back there at some point, uh, never know. Yeah, definitely. That would be awesome. Yeah. And also, so I was reading more about you. You're also an outdoorsman. You like to ski. You like to be in the mountains. So you're in a good location to, uh, you have good access to ski, uh, skiing out there with Tahoe right near you and all that. How often, how often do you go skiing out there? 
Um, quite a bit. Um, so, I mean, being in Portland, Oregon is, you know, we've got, you know, we've got Mount Hood, you know, an hour away and, you know, Central Oregon. I, so I grew up in a small mountain town in Central Oregon um, called Bend. It's not so small anymore. So I kind of grew up in in the outdoors and, and on the mountain and stuff. So now that I've had had kids of my own who are eight and six that, you know, it's kind of getting them, getting them going. So we've been skiing a couple of years with them and it's just I love it. It's kind of why I love living here, access to, to nature and the mountains and the rivers and the lakes and all that stuff. So it's just nice to kind of live in the city and be able to get outside the city and do some of those things and take your mind off of the day to day and, you know, put your phone away and and let kids experience some things outside of that. So I, I love, I love living in the Northwest. We did live in, we lived in Texas for about two and a half years. That's where Helm, Helm is based in Texas and still everybody else lives there. But I always just kind of say, I'm not I'm not tough enough for the Texas summers. I just, it, I was, it just made me, it made me crazy. I love Austin. We loved Austin so much. My, my youngest son was born in Austin. And so we have huge affinity there and I get back there all the time, but I was not tough enough to survive those Texas summers. Yeah. Those summers in Texas are definitely rough. They're scorching hot. It takes a lot to survive out there. <laughs> not everybody could survive a Portland winter, you know, the kind of the gray and a little bit of the drizzle and stuff would make some people go crazy. So yeah, it's kind of, you know, everybody's got what they're, they're used to and how they grew up and stuff. So there's a place for everybody. Yeah, that that's so true. Yeah, I really love it out west. I love California, the scenery, the, the wife and I a couple of years ago took a took a trip out there to just primarily to visit all the national parks. And we just had just a magical time looking at the Helm website. You guys have several different shoe models. And I noticed that the Bradley shoe mm. is named after yours truly. Um yeah. What, what was that like getting a shoe style named after you? Did you pick this style? Did you like design it yourself or how did that work? Being a product guy and, and a product background, it's like I kind of describe myself, you know, everybody's got a skill set that they're good at, right? And nobody that runs a business is an expert at everything. And so my background at Adidas, I was, a, I was kind of a merchant, right? So I built product, I merchandised product, I sold product. I worked, you know, on different categories and stuff. So I've always had my hands in the product, right? So sample size is nine and a half because I've got to try everything on, right? So I've got my hands in everything. But when we came on, Joshua, who's the founder of Helm, we kind of talked about how the how the brand was evolving and 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 what are some other categories and stuff. And I and I really pushed him hard to find this type of product, right? And so a, a shoe that could be worn up to dressy, a little dressier, but was also still very casual in those sense and had that helm element. Like we, we kind of approach every product, like what makes it a helm? You know, because mm-hmm. if it's, we're just knocking off other people, we're not doing a good job, right? And so, I mean, that's a, that's a good, another good example of like the white midsole, mm-hmm. you know, all of those things. So he, we pushed him, we pushed hard to kind of get something that was an authentic shoe for us, which is our first shoe ever. And so Helm Boots makes boots uh, and it was our first shoe ever. And so he, he named it after my, me at the time and which was great. So it was a good, it was a good year for me because I was helping an apparel company here in Portland and he, he approached me. He's like, well, why don't you ever wear our pants? I was like, cause your pants aren't good. Uh, then they don't fit. And he's like, well, let's work on it. And so we worked on it and came up with a new pant. And so I have a Bradley pant named after me too. So it was no kind of no. like head to toe there for a little bit, um, which was fun, but yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, that's one of the, the, the fun parts about Helm is we, every boot and every shoe is named after somebody that's adjacent to us. Um, somebody who's important to us, who helps us as a business, helps us as people. The Charlie sneaker is named after my daughter. Um, there's the Declan boot, which is named after my son, you know, the, the artists behind me. And so there's, um, the Xander shoe is named after my brother, who is one of the owners of death and co who we do some partnership stuff with. And the writer is named after Mallory who runs marketing for us. It's named after her son. So all sorts of things, uh, kind of around the naming conventions of people that are just really, really close to us. Oh, very cool. I didn't realize the Declan. I was looking at the Declan on your website. That's a very attractive boot. So is the, so is the Charlie. That's a really nice looking piece. That, of- well, that, that's who was knocking on the door and trying to interrupt us. Okay. <laughs> that's okay. I just want to say, first and foremost, as a father myself, I appreciate nothing more than a video bomb by the kids. <laughs> it's just, I mean, we've all spent a lot of home, time at home on video calls over the last couple of years, and it's yeah. just... It's kind of accepted and uh, it's part of it and it's fun. So how old are your kids? 
Uh, I have a, my youngest is seven. My second oldest, my stepson, he's uh, 14. And my, my oldest daughter is 15 years old. My youngest, Scarlett, she's obsessed with YouTube. And uh, she's always looking for that, her her uh, few moments in the spotlight. So she always, <laughs> she hears me. Okay. Yeah, she hears me recording and she almost always insists on uh, bombing it to one degree or another. So. That's life. I guess. Yeah. Exactly. That, you know, we're, we're people, we're, we're organic beings and we have families and, you know, sometimes those family members want to, want to drop in on us. <laughs> yeah. Especially when they're seven and they don't listen and you say, Hey, it's just kind of part of being a kid. Exactly. That's so cool that you mentioned about the names because this here is the Zind boot named after Amelia Zind. Though I was trying to look her up. I couldn't find much information on her, but from what I can tell, this is one of your like flagship models. Who, who is Amelia Zind? So Amelia was one of kind of the original employees of Helm and did a lot of kind of the customer service originally and then really evolved into a lot of the writing and did some social media and stuff for us. And then, so she left the company officially like four or five years ago and moved back to Vermont. And, and but we've never like, she's always maintained connection of our, with our brand. So she still like proofreads a lot of the copy. She's in charge of the Saturday six email, which comes out every week. And so I kind of look at Amelia as the, the one who is the gatekeeper to our brand voice. Like she's just been around the brand for so long. So kind of anything that comes out where we say anything or we curate a lot of our emails and stuff like comes through the lens and the voice of Amelia. So she's been awesome. She's great. She's back now back in Texas and um, one of the ones we see every time I uh, every time I go back, but yeah, she's great. Very cool. Wow. Well, Amelia, if you're listening, thank you so much. I love this boot. <laughs> I wear it in your honor every day. <laughs> She'll love that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's fabulous. I was looking over your guys' website, and I I finally came to this one. I just I just love the the silhouette of it. The last Zin started in 2009 when Josh Bingaman was the CEO at the time. And you came in in 2016. So by that point, I assume he already had like sort of the last picked out for the bo- for the boot and things like that. Is that right? Um, a little bit. I mean, I think there's there's been a couple evolutions of, of the brand. So when he started it, his original production was in Turkey. Okay. And so he had a, a family a family member that was in Turkey who had some connections at some factories there, and so. If you go back and look at some of the original Helm products, they're very, very different, very European inspired. And he, and he wanted a an American brand that could compete with the European footwear brands. And, and then like just due to some complexity around running a business, he moved the production back to the US. And so the kind of the next iteration of Helm was kind of made in the America, classic Americana boots that you'll see out of some of the more traditional heritage brands. Okay. As as I came on and as we moved uh, the brand along a little bit, we kind of have modernized a little bit, and so kind of walking away a little bit from that Americana stuff to things are a little bit little little more modern, a little more more sophisticated. Things have toper toe shapes, a little dressier, uh, things like that, and so all of the the lasts and things that you're talking about toe shapes and stuff. If you go back and look at kind of the the history of the brand, this is kind of the Zen is really where we're at today, which is just a little bit more tapered toe. You go back a step, it's a little bit more rounded, a little bit more Americana. Now we have some products and if you go back even further, it's, you know, some square toes, it's super pointy. It's, you know, some of those things that are very high, uh, very fashion driven European stuff. So the brand has kind of evolved some of it doing with where we produce the products and, and things like that, but just kind of the design philosophy and, and what customers have responded to, um, what have they liked? And, you know, when customers, when we introduce a shoe and customers really respond to that, it's okay. Like they're telling us what they want us to make. Um, and we have to listen to that. Okay. I got you. Wow. You know, the more you talk, the more I'm sort of blown away by just how many, how many footholds your company has in so many countries, you know, you mentioned Turkey, the boots are built in Brazil, right? You, you've got your headquarters in Austin, you live in Portland, Oregon. It's just sort of crazy how many different, you know, because I know a lot of consumers, they're obsessed with sort of just 
made in the USA, you know, sourced with everything sourced within the USA. But the truth is, and the more that I sort of explore sourcing leathers from different places for like, you know, building my bags or whatnot, the more my eyes are just opening to, there are so many fabulous tanneries overseas in China, in Japan, Brazil, Dominican Republic, as Dominican Republic, Italy, obviously. Like, I wanted to ask more about this particular last. What what's this last called again? Is it four fifteen? I call it the Zen last, right? And that's okay. the last, and 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 but that's just how I do. I call it in the terminologies, but I know, I believe it is the four one five last because we, yeah. we kind of shifted and renamed them the four one five is the the area code for one of the zip codes I believe for Austin. We went back and renamed all of the last based on, on, on zip codes and area codes that the, the business or Joshua has been involved with. So he owned a shoe store in San Francisco and uh, obviously Austin and stuff like that. So um, I, you know, I'm kind of a stubborn old man at this point. I'm like, it's just the Zen last for me, but I know yeah. like, you know, so we can you know, call it that. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of like we, we design, you know, so much of a, sh- a shoe construction has to start with the last, right? And the look of, and I always, as just as a consumer, you know, you, you have to look down at your feet and feel very confident in and like the look that you're seeing, right? And and I always, Joshua was very much a love black boots that had cap toes and a, and a much more traditional round shape. Mm-hmm. Um, I like a more tapered. I don't like a cap toe and I don't own a single black boot. Right. And so there's all these differences and and preferences around how you are as a consumer, but there's, there is so much of that psychology of like, when you look down and the shape is right for you, you feel very confident in what you're wearing. Right. And so that's why we have to kind of explore different shapes and toe shapes and uh, cap toes, no cap toes, all of those, those factors come into play when we're beginning to design a new product and build a new product. It's like, okay, this is a, we want it to have a little bit more elongated. And there's just all of those things that go into it. But the last is the the most important thing we, we think about before we, we start designing something. Okay. I got you. So how, how many different lasts do you guys currently, are you guys currently building on, or do you have just like sort of a, a mix of templates that you sort of choose depending on the design of the shoe or? Yeah. I mean, so we, I mean, there's, there's part of being trying to be consistent with your lasts because of fit. Right. And so you want to like, if somebody really likes this last and, and you love the Zen boot and you like that shape, you're going to want other styles that have that kind of similar look and feel. And so we, we utilize some existing assets at factories. Uh, we develop our own lasts when, when we need to right now, we're, we're building a new shoe next year and we're developing a new last specifically for that shoe, because there's, a specific look we want out of it that's different than anything we do. So we probably utilize five to six different lasts right now when there's some some big changes and, and big differences. And there's also some just small changes that it's it might be very similar to the Zen look, but we're we want to do it on a shoe and 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 make some small little tweaks and things like that. So okay. Very cool. That's really smart because you know, a lot of brands that I've followed closely over the years, yeah, they have their classics. You know, Alden has the Berry last and the True Balance last. That's sort of the two go-to lasts for Alden, you know what I mean? Yeah. Then they have, you know, a dozen or so other lasts that are a lot more dressy and they'll build certain boots with a specific perfect purpose. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like their Grant last and their Aberdeen lasts are really dressy. And so they, you know, they'll put those on like their Oxford type of a look, you know, not their everyday sort of boot, you know, they're, they're not casual, like the Barry or the True Balance. It, it makes a lot of sense to have just to have different lasts. One thing that I, I realized when I made my video, I was researching Babo leather. This is the Zind is built in Babo leather. And it led me to the Krumenauer tannery in Brazil. I realized I did a little bit more research the Babo doesn't come from the Krumenauer tannery, though you do source some leathers from Krumenauer in Brazil. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Okay. This actually comes from Bermudez leather in the Dominican Republic. Correct. So <laughs> in my update videos, I'm going to, I'm going to correct that. How many tanneries does Helm currently source from? What's that like? Well, we are now we're sourcing from one tannery. So we're, we're pretty much exclusively sourcing out of Brazil, but when we shifted our production, uh, we utilized Bermudas out of the Dominican Republic initially, and we were getting all of our leather out of there. And it's a 
you know, world-class tannery and they do the amazing things and um, just the logistics sometimes. And this gets into like the minutia of, you know, a, a footwear business of tanning things and then getting them to Brazil, you know, it's just expensive. Right. And so one of the, the things we worked on with, with our Brazil tannery is, you know, getting the quality of hides down there that, that we expect in. Right. And so a lot of the hides, we or almost all the hides we use are from U S leather, right? So there's steers from their, their Texas hides, most of them. Right. And so we were able to work with the Brazilian tanneries to begin to import Texas hides that are of the quality that we require to, to produce our products. Um, and so once they were able to get the quality of hides, and then we were able to work on getting the colors and shades that we, that we like, then we were able to kind of shift and, and begin to utilize some local tanneries down in Brazil that are adjacent to our factories. And it just streamlines the whole process. It's faster, it's cheaper, um, all that stuff. I could see that being the case for sure. Yeah, it would make sense to want to get everything in Brazil. To my audience, sorry for that uh, mix up there. I thought that this was from, I thought this was a Brazilian leather. This is actually Dominican leather. Bermudez leather is a family owned tannery in the Dominican Republic founded in 1940. It's a multi-generational family owned tannery and has a long reputation of creating some of the world's best and most versatile leathers. I think they make like really good rum too. I think oh, okay. like there's, if you go deeper with them, I think it's like, there's some like rum they produce and stuff. They're, they're, they're amazing partners and we love working with them and some, some fantastic love. There's a lot of, a lot of really amazing footwear that happens in the Dominican Republic that, that a lot of people don't realize that there's a lot of factories. There's a lot of production. There's a lot of tanneries. There's a lot of footwear infrastructure in the Dominican Republic. They do some amazing work out of there. That's interesting. I'm learning so much too about the Mexican tanneries, specifically La Farc. And uh, apparently down in Mexico, it's basically the shoemaking capital of the world. I, this is, it, my eyes have just opened recently to this. Like there's a lot of really reputable tanneries all across South America and bootmakers all across South America. In oh, fact, you, yeah, I mean, you've seen, you've seen Leon, Mexico specifically in the, in the towns adjacent to that become a, a big shoemaker off of a couple of brands that 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 went in there i'm not sure it's the shoe making capital of the world quite yet but they do a lot of like really good work down there therefore like the tanneries and stuff you know i did it when i was working with adidas like the the local production that you can that you can get out of mexico is fantastic um so even for athletic apparel and stuff like that the the, the capabilities and the the infrastructure and the technology that they built into manufacturing just about everything in that country is is, is pretty amazing yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really crazy. I would love to tour all these countries and, and have a look at all these different operations they have going on. It's so fascinating. <laughs> when you talk about tanneries, right? I mean, there's, there's quality tanneries all over. I mean, there's quality tanneries in the U S I mean, Horween's a, a legend, right? And, and it's kind of the one that everybody kind of knows the name. What I'll say is like, everything goes, starts with the quality of your height. Right. And there are grade A hides, B, you can grade the hides and you can find less quality leather from any tannery. Right. And so it's up to you as a brand and as a consumer to figure out like how much is the brand willing to invest in the leather? Because at the end of the day, you can resole a boot, you have to have quality construction, but the leather is really the piece that's going to last for 15, 20 years if you're using a really good leather. And so it's kind of one of those things you can't cut corners on. And so you hear a lot best materials. We don't cut corners. We build it the work right way and all that stuff. And it's just, you know, you've got to kind of do your little, your research because everybody kind of says the same thing. And so it's one of those things we do. We, we cut our boots in half. We <laughs> show them, we show what's inside. Um, you know, we don't have core keel stacks and we use grade A hides and on just about everything and stuff like that. So yeah, that's we take, awesome. we take, we take that stuff serious because at the end of the day, like we're, we love to build like good product and hmm. it's kind of in our DNA from hmm. the entire team is, you know, we love to build boots and it's kind of the thing that, that drives us. And so we get really excited of building products that can last for a really long time. And we know that the leather is, is the piece that starts that. That's true. And as a leather nerd myself, I can tell you, I'm obsessed with leather. I'm, ex I'm obsessed with, you know, whether or not it's veg tanned or chrome tanned, I'm obsessed with, like my buddy Phil at Ashton Leather, he says leather is a language. 
And that mm. resonated with me so deeply because it's true. Like leather is never the same thing twice. You know what I mean? Like it, it has so many properties and depending on the layers that you're using, you know, whether it's the grain or the, the flesh side or the suede side, or, you know, it gets super technical, super quick and every layer exhibits different qualities. And I just, I just love it. It's so, it's so fascinating whether the leather has a pull up or not it'll yeah. completely differently. It's just, yeah, I just love it. And every, every pair of boots that I own, just, they're all different, you know, even if they're in the same leather, that sometimes the same tannage from the same tannery and the same color will exhibit different properties, just depending on the batch. You know, yeah. That's the sort of thing I really geek out on. And a lot of my friends do too. We're just, we're obsessed with leather. I know that every tannery has a different process and this Babo leather is unlike anything I've ever owned before. And it's, Fabulous. And I know a lot of guys are like, they're sort of hor horween purists. I've really felt enriched by trying out different leathers from different areas. And this, you know, this stuff, it's super durable. It's got a really nice temper to it, real firm, lots of support all throughout my foot. It's, and not to mention the way my foot sits inside the boot, I feel so cushioned, so well seated. And it's, I do, I, I attribute that in large part to the insole that you guys have going on on the inside. Unfortunately, I can't really show it. <laughs> the camera yeah, it's, a tough, it's a tough one to get get a view at, but yeah, yeah. There's a padded insole that's got just a little bit of extra cushion and my, small my, details, right? The little, the little things. Yeah, my foot feels so locked into this boot. I I don't know any other way to really describe it. I just when I'm in there, I just feel like wow, I'm seated perfectly inside this thing. <laughs> I think the one thing you know when you buy a pair of boots, like boots are meant to be worn, right? They're not. They're not meant to just sit in your closet and break out every once in a while. They're like, in, in going back to the leather thing, like good boots with good leather, like they should look better as you go. And like, and that's different for everybody. Like you said, like it could be, I don't, you don't touch them. You like to beat them up or like you like to keep them a little shiny or, or and take care of it with conditioning and thing like in, in, in all of those types of things. But, you know, you've got to build a product that's, that's going to last for somebody that wants to wear them all the time and go out there and, and have them be your kind of travel companion. You talk about like traveling around the world of like grab, you just need a pair of boots. Yes. Right. I mean, I, I, I mean, the days are gone of me travel. I, I, I travel with a pair of boots and my running shoes and that's it. Nice. And you don't need to have a multiple pairs based on what, like that Zen boot could, you could, you could go to a bunch of meetings in the suit if you needed to. And then you could hit, you know, whatever you need to do afterwards. Like it's yeah. I think kind of having that versatility of, of good boot, but it's got to be comfortable enough to, to last through the day too. Definitely. Yeah. I'm with you too. That's, that's the non-negotiable. Whenever I travel, I'm a little different from you. I actually pack two pair of boots when I travel. I don't, I don't uh, take running shoes with me anymore. <laughs> I just take two pair of boots to alternate day in and day out. They're a phenomenal travel companion because they really do make you ready for anything. A pair of sneakers, I don't feel very confident in my ability to hike all day in a pair of sneakers, definitely not. But like in a pair of like this, a service boot, like Helm, yeah, take take me across the globe in these, you know what I mean? <laughs> One thing I really like, and I haven't seen this, maybe it's just because of the brands that I've traditionally bought, but one thing I really like about your soul is this sort of it's almost like a vibram topi but it's installed into it's got its own layer in yeah. built into the sole now i'm i'm a big fan of leather soles i love the breathability and the support that they offer um and i used to install topies on the bottom of my shoes i don't do it anymore like on this pair yeah. of wolverines I, I stopped putting the topi on because i realized it, it it resists the boot from naturally flexing the way it was yeah. built but if you install it like this, like you guys did, as its own layer, you actually carve out from here to up here. This was all leather. You carve out the layer of leather and you put the rubber, I guess you'd call it a topi or just a rubber half sole, yeah. um, and install it that way. That totally flexes perfectly with the boot. It was built into it. So it was meant, to, it's not glued on, in other words. <laughs> so. No. Yeah, I really appreciate that feature because that's the part of the sole that's going to get the most wear. And that's obviously the rubber is obviously going to prevent that. So, yeah, in addition to your white midsole, I really have to commend you guys on this as well. I think that was a really nice touch. And most guys out there, I'd say probably 90 percent of guys 
uh, avoid the leather sole because they're afraid of wearing through it. And this is sort of the best of both worlds there. So it's, it's interesting. It's getting into like shoe building, like nerd territory here a little bit, like the outsole, like that outsole was one of the most expensive pieces on that boot. Oh, right? really? and you look at just, you know, a, a full poured rubber outsole, that sole probably costs three times as much as that because Oh, wow. You have to have a leather piece and then somebody has to go in there and you, like I said, carve it out and then, then put the rubber in. It's just the whole outsole is handcrafted. So it's very high touch. Not a lot of people want to do it. It's, it's very expensive, but when we, we used to have full leather soles, yeah. you know, they wear down a little bit faster. Um, there's some slippage at the beginning, right? Um, before you kind of beat it up a little bit and scuff it up. We didn't want to lose that, that aesthetic of like really kind of the dressier look of having a leather sole, but we also just wanted to add a little bit more grip and a little bit more durability to the product without changing the aesthetic. And so that's kind of how we utilize this. And we've got a couple of different versions on different, on different shoes, but it, you, you kind of nailed it. It's a very crafted outsole, yes. um, which, is, which is very, very expensive and very labor intensive, but it's the right way to do it for this product. Now we don't do it on all of our products, but like that's the product you guys wanted to build. And yeah. it's, it's more, it's more labor intensive, obviously working with my cobbler, cobbler, Sonny, I go into his shop sometimes and yeah, to carve that out and to put that in, I can tell you that is no small task. That'll take somebody a lot of time. I'm sure your people that build your boots in Brazil are very adept at that by now, but I can attest that is, that is no small task right there to put that in there. That's not something that can be accomplished very quickly at all. <laughs> There's not a lot of outsold suppliers that really, you know, do that either. So, I mean, it becomes, you know, kind of a challenge sometimes if you, if you want to find a new vendor or something and lead times are longer. And so if you're, you're chasing a, a good seller or something that's selling, and you're trying to get more in. That, that outsole just takes longer to make in addition to being more expensive. So it's harder to kind of get back in the product faster on some of these things. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I really love it. I think it's, it not only looks good, but it functions well as well. And I, I really like the branding here, the relief here that you guys yeah on there. Yeah. That's thank that's, you. Appreciate that. Yeah, totally. And oh man. Yeah. The stitching, everything is like really well done. So kudos on that, sir. <laughs> Thank you. You guys did source from Horween for a time, right? Mm -hmm. You were you were using Chrome Excel. Yeah. I didn't see any of those on your site anymore. Um, I assume you guys probably sold through all that by now. <laughs> yeah, a lot of the the Horween stuff was we utilized when we were um, making our stuff in the U.S. And so we was kind of uh, we had a factory up in Maine that was making uh -huh. all of the um, product and utilized the Chrome Excel stuff and we had production up there. And so as we shifted away from the made in the USA stuff to the Brazilian factory, um, we looked for alternative um, leather suppliers and tanneries. And so that's kind of where we shifted away from where we, I didn't realize you were building your boots in Maine there for a time. That's cool. Yeah. So when we, when we came back from Turkey, everything was kind of moved to a facility in Maine that is a, is a manufacturer. Okay. Very cool, man. Learning so many things yet. You guys really have gone like so international with all this. It's, it's so awesome. In 13 years, but there's kind of a lot of, a lot of iterations of, of, of the brand and, and the products and the people and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes sense because there's so many moving parts to a business. You know, I don't have to tell you that, but I'm just learning it myself. I just started my own website, Dale's Leatherworks and uh, man, I'm the one guy behind it. I manage the website. I manage the pictures, the photography, the building the stuff, sourcing the leather, ordering the leather, ordering the, the tools, the equipment. If there's a new task that I've never performed, I have to go learn that. It's like, oh man, it's so hard. Yeah. yeah. I mean, small businesses, it's like the energy and the excitement of, of a small business. You get to do so many different things. And that's why I'm like, I, I don't feel bad not remembering the name of the the last because there's just so many pieces and we have such a like a awesome team that that is is I mean knows so much more about the product than than I do. Like yeah. I love getting back into our store when I go back to Texas and and selling, you know, when the customer comes in. I love like talking to customers and trying to sell them sell them a pair of boots. It's like that's just you know, but there's inevitable like a question will come up and I don't know the answer. 
And so like, you know, that's kind of part of it, like having a, a small business and um, having people that are also really, really passionate about what you're doing that, that know more than you do about certain things. And so yeah. I'm lucky at that instance of, you know, things like the fine line and having other people that can, can relate to kind of customer needs and Absolutely. see which direction we go with, you know, outsoles or how do we make, you know, update things and stuff like that. Definitely. Yeah. You touched on it a little bit earlier, but what kind of boots do you have in your rotation? Do you wear boots every day? Are you like a true diehard boot guy? Like, uh, like some of us are. <laughs> I, I've become one and it's funny. I, I started a blog for Helm and I, it's, I'm probably due to do another one, which is and the first one was like how I became a boot guy and, you know, 16 years with Adidas. I, I had a, a couple of pair of Allen Edmonds, like really nice shoes, but I didn't have a pair of boots. And so when I started here, it was my first pair of boots. And now I'm almost exclusively boots and Ooh. I certainly have my rotation of ones that I like. And now that we have some sneakers like the Xander sneaker, I'll wear when it's, when it's warm and it's hot and, and worn in shorts and stuff like that. I'm not a, a boot short guy, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm a boot guy. And, um, I, the one that I, I'm going to call my dad boot is the Lou. Um, I just, it's so comfortable. It's more comfortable than any sneaker I've ever had. And it's just kind of, as I'm ro rolling around town, you know, working, working out of the house now a little bit. And like, it's just the one I throw in to run the market, kids, soccer games, like traveling on ski trips. Like, it's just kind of the one that's always with me. Um, and oh. then there, the Zend is the one that I, I love when I've, when I've got to like, you know, be a professional and go to meetings and stuff. It's just the one that I love for all of those things. And then the Hollis is kind of my everyday kind of winter boot as well, just cause it's got the traction. But like, I think the, the lose really kind of got this special place in my heart and, you know, they actually Mallory from, from uh, who runs marketing for us took them away from me about a month ago. Cause she's like, you've had them. They were the first pair that we, uh, it was like the sample pair of the factory sent us, sent us and I've worn them for, you know, years now and they're just so comfortable and they're so beat up and they're so beautiful. And she's like, I need those. I've got to do some, like, I got to put them in a photo shoot or, you know, show them next to a new pair and stuff. So I've got a new pair of loose downstairs and I'm, I'm breaking in as we, as we speak. And they're just, they're just so easy for just kind of everything, which I love. Definitely. Yeah. I can see that. That is awesome. Wow. Well, I'm glad that you guys are doing the blog and, and documenting the age and the, evolution of your boot over time i think that's that's really smart because that's that's something people want to know you know leather nerds especially they want to know what this stuff's going to look like after it's well beaten up uh which we intend to do with all of our shoes yeah. so you should do you, you yeah, should do absolutely. Yeah. you mentioned that you source all your leather in brazil now um is it exclusive to the krumenauer tannery or are there other tanneries in brazil that you're working with now it's primarily the Krumenauer Tannery. And so we have a good relationship with them and um, a lot of our core letters. I mean, the, what you want to do is find a, someone who can produce the same leather over and over and over, right? So if you're trying to switch tanneries and you have a standard, it makes it very, very hard. Now there's certain leathers that might pop up that maybe that, that tannery isn't specialized in, but generally down there, I mean, Krumenauer is pretty capable of doing just about everything we need. And so trying to stick with them with a the relationship it is important, right? You know, you're going to come to them first. It just kind of building that partnership is, is pretty important to the relationship and it's easier for the factory. They know where they're getting all of their leather from. Mm -hmm. We know the standards and we know the quality. And if, if something happens yeah. and you have this deep relationship, if a leather is not right one time, like, you know, they're going to make it right because you're doing so much business together and you're a partner with them. And so we've had times where a, a batch of leather has come in and it's been too dark and yeah. it, it hasn't, it hasn't been what we've needed. And so we said, you know what, we'll, we'll take that leather. We'll do a project with it so that you don't have to eat the costs of it. And we'll, I mean, you, there's a couple of boots. It's like a dark natural. And you're like, well, why is one natural one's dark natural? It's like, well, the tannery just made it a little too dark that time. So we, we spun up a project to help them. And while they go back and kind of redevelop and get it right. So it's okay. kind of having that partnership and good relationships kind of across your supply chain um, are, are really important. You need consistency with your quality and, and your colors. Definitely. I can relate to that. Yes. I've been working with, uh, I've been working with Seidel Tannery to source a lot of the material for my bags and they have a leather that's their version of Chrome Excel. Essentially it's called double shot. 
and I ordered five sides in their British tan double shot and it came out the first batch that I ordered it was like darker brown it mm. had some notes of red in it but then I ordered 10 more sides of it and it came out and it was a true tan this time it was British tan it was really it, it was a lot lighter way lighter in fact and it and it has more notes of like orange in it some yellows it's a medium brown as compared to a dark brown so yeah I could totally relate with that but you know, it's like, it's one of those things, like you, you just roll with it. And uh, I just, on my website, I actually just named it a different color from British tan because, you know, if the customer is expecting a tan, well, this is what the tannery produced under the label British tan, but that first batch wasn't a real tan. This new batch is. So that's kind of how I play it as well. It's like, well, I have the leather here. It's going to cost me like Two hundred dollars to send it back, and then the tanner, you know, the tannery has to figure out what to do with it. So, why do any of that? You know, it's a beautiful leather, and you can work with it. You can make products with it. You just have to decide what route to take. And uh, yeah, so I commend, I definitely commend you on that because that's something you know you don't want to waste good leather. I mean, sometimes you have to, right? Like sometimes you just have to reject things. And and we have, you know, the reason why we chose the factory we chose and the tannery we chose is a lot of times they'll come to us and say, this didn't pass inspection. This didn't pass our internal inspection and we've got to go back. Now, irritating that we need that leather to make shoes, but really grateful that we have partners that have the same standards as us because it would be a lot worse if they send us shoes with leather that didn't meet our standards. Cause then, yeah. you know, then you're at a whole nother issue. So, you know, having the partners that catch it early uh, is also really important because there's just times where things happen. Like sometimes, sometimes there's an outsole that didn't get produced correctly, right? Sometimes there's, you know, a heel stack that falls off and it's very, very rare, but it, it happens. Sometimes there's a lace that breaks, but um, having partners that have really high quality standards is, is super important. That is important. Yeah. Recently I was talking to my buddy, Dave, who also does interviews like this. He's the vintage future on YouTube. And he was talking to Brett Viberg and Brett Viberg sourced a horse butt, I think from Italy, and I forget the tannery, maybe Mariam, but essentially, this is the first time I ever heard it, but he said that this leather failed production. I'm like, what the heck does that mean? Uh, apparently, every time they would stretch the leather over the last, it would have like strange like puckering, like it just didn't form into a boot correctly. Like you could use that leather for other things, yeah. but in, he didn't have the heart to move forward and make boots out of that particular hide because it it quote failed production in other words it just didn't it didn't last correctly it's yeah. just not all leathers built for boots you know what i mean a lot of people ask me oh what's the most durable boot leather well it's like you don't want to put the most durable leather on boots it won't it won't flex it'll be like a piece of wood <laughs> so no it's it there's a balance with all this i mean even, even with hides i mean you look at certain hides that come in and you're at the factory and you'll look at it and, and you might say, okay, well, only 60% of this hide can be used on boots. And the next one, it might be 80. And like, you just, cause they're animals, right. And there's, there's things that have happened to animals. And so you just kind of, there's uh, every hide's different. Right. And so that's why you, you have to really go for the, the highest grade. Um, but there's the yeah. thickness of the leather, right. It can't be too thick. Right. Cause you know, a good boot should have a little bit of break in, right. And that's the quality, but you know, there's a little bit different expectations for, sneakers, right? You don't want a sneaker that you really have to spend, you know, five or six wears breaking in, right? So there's all those kind of expectations, the thickness, the quality, how that's made, you know, as a manufacturer, as, you know, that makes boots, like you have to have partners that understand and you're very clear on like the quality because, you know, it, it's not production quality or they've got to know what that means for your brand because it's different for a different brand. Definitely. To write off that point, this is uh, a piece of Wicket and Craig Latigo. It's nine ounces thick. And let me tell you what, you see how it's almost like yeah. a board. It's like, yeah. a, you could, yeah. you could knock on it. It's, you would not want a shoe made. No, leather. <laughs> no, not. No, you could use that in the insole or you could use that as, as a layer of, of the sole, you know, but you would not want this as an upper, you would never break it in. It would be, it would hurt. It would kill your foot to try to do that. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the proper weight for an upper 
leather would be about three to four ounces, maybe, maybe two, depending. But I, I don't think you want to go above like four and a half. Four and a half is like pushing the, this is, I'm, I'm an amateur, I don't know, but, and looking at yours, I want to say that this is probably about three ounces thick on this, on this part. You know, you might, you might know, I, I don't know if I ever refer to it in terms of the ounceage. It's more of like the millimeters of like how thick a millimeter is it. And, and oh. right. That's just kind of how we like, we, you know, we just launched a new boot and it's called the Heinz. And it's the first time we've used a really, really soft leather that has zero break in. Cause it's, it's a, it's a chucka boot, right? It's, it's, there's just different expectations for that. So it's, it's mm. a little thinner leather. Right. And I'm, I would, be making up if I told you what the, the millimeters are. And this is where it's good to have smart people that, that work with you. But we yeah. always kind of talk about it, like the thickness and the millimeters of how thick a leather is, you know, for a, like a, a work boot, a dress boot, things like that. Okay. That really makes a lot of sense to me though. So, but yeah, speaking of Brazil, have you gotten to travel to Brazil? Not for Helm. I've been there for Adidas. Um, it's, oh, cool. it was fall of 2020. We were going to go down and visit for the first time. And, you know, that just obviously for obvious reasons has not happened. We are meeting, yeah. meeting with them for the, for the first time in person next month. They're, they're in Texas. So um, I'm going to go down there and meet with the, the factory for the first time. And then this fall, we're going to try and get down there as well. So it will, hopefully in the next six months, we'll have our first visit, but it is it's interesting to have such a strong partnership and relationship where we have never actually physically been there, which is not, not usual. We used to go to the, the factory in Maine four times a year. Right. And I love being in the factory, hands-on building things. It's just, you know, COVID changed everything for how businesses have to do things. And, and that was one of those things. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I could only imagine the 2020 year was, was, pretty challenging for a lot of people for sure <laughs> it wasn't a good time for the you know kind of high-end luxury footwear business i'll tell you that much you know as everybody was home and buying their all birds and you know hanging out in their lululemon or or whatever it may be and you make a product for people to be out in the world and whether that's you know weddings or offices or european trips like we talked about like getting back to europe or you know, dinners and all those things. Like, you know, that's kind of where, you know, it's for the, the adventure and uh, when people aren't doing that just because they can't like it. So definitely it makes it tough, but yeah. Have you noticed a turnaround since 2022 sort of took off and things started? Did yeah. have you noticed like an improvement in, in, you know, movement of product and stuff like that? Yeah. I, I feel for the first time, like we're, we're kind of through now there's some economic, challenges going on right now in, in, with, with the economy that, but I don't believe, I believe we're, we're fully through the impact of COVID mm -hmm. on the market. Um, there's still supply chain challenges that are happening. I feel fortunate that we produce out of Brazil and I think haven't faced the same challenges as anybody that's producing out of Southeast Asia, whether that's China, Vietnam, and the, like in kind of those areas, we've been hit less, but there's still supply chain challenges, the raw material challenges, there's transportation increases. There's all of these things that have just spiked or an also used to take 30 daily time. Now it's taking 90 and just wow. those complexities are still, still there, regardless of whether the, the, the demand in the marketplace is back. So I feel like we're through that, but, um, there's still some other little challenges. Yeah, I'm sure there's some straggling issues. I was hearing stories like, oh, you know, if this factory, if one person got COVID, they would all isolate for two weeks and nobody would come to work except for like two people. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, our factory shut down for two weeks once. Okay. And that was it. And for the whole, the whole time, right. And you, you think about, you know, entire cities shutting down in, in, you know, Southeast Asia and China and, ports being closed and container ships, you know, and all of that, I mean, all of the, the horror stories was very, very real. And we, and we didn't, we didn't face a lot of that. Um, mm -hmm. We faced a lot of challenges, um, but that was not one of them. And I feel very fortunate that we, we didn't have to face that. That's awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, from what I know, you know, Brazil's sort of a hotter country. They're sort of uh, very well irradiated with sunlight. And uh, so people's vitamin D levels are probably higher and uh, they might be a little healthier on that, on that corner of the planet. <laughs> In addition to Krumenauer, what other tanneries uh, are you using 
in Brazil. That's the primary one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I get you. Yeah. That's, right. that's the one we use. Um, and if we, sometimes we'll, we'll find leathers that we really like, and we just, we brief those into cream and hour and say, we want something like this, or what do you have that's like this? And then they explore their library. Okay, cool. cool. Yeah. Well, forgive me. I'm going to drop the dreaded S word right now. I'm going to ask you about Shell Cordovan. <laughs> it's always the question that comes up in the boot nerd uh, world. Do you guys ever plan to run any Shell Cordovan makeups? Yeah, I think so. Cool. I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think we're always exploring. We've got some really cool boot projects coming out next year. Um, okay. And we do, we like... We like to engage with our community. We send a lot of notes out to our customers and, and like, hey, you know, what are you interested in? What are you eyeing? Like, you know, no, I mean, certainly we have a creative vision for our brand and our products and stuff like that. But it's also, you know, talking to people like yourselves of like, what are you into? Like, what's, what are you seeing? Like, what are the people you're talking about wearing? And like, you've got to like, you've got to like listen to people and you've got to listen to your customers and what they want. Uh, and not just think that you're able to predict the future and like that just because you think they're going to want it is, is what the market, I mean, ultimately the market's going to decide. They're going to decide whether they like your stuff. They're going to decide whether it's the right price point. Um, they're going to decide whether they like a crafted outsole like that. I mean, customers are going to decide all of those things. And so like the more you can interact and ask questions up front, the better. And so, yeah. um, you know, we do, we listen. And so I think there's that, you know, that aspect of, I, I don't, I don't see us not coming out with something like that in the, in the future. Ooh. Oh man, that's awesome. Does Krumenauer produce any shell or any horse rump or anything like that? That's a good question. I would say yes. I think they do. I mean, they do, they do a lot of production for a lot of, lot of brands. And so like okay. what they have access to is, is certainly out there. Are there any uh, new updates, any new maybe boot models or new letters coming down the line that we could keep our eyes? Yeah, we've got some some really cool like waterproof suede that are coming out here in the next month. Nice. Um, okay. Which we're really excited about. We've got some rough out leathers. We've worked really hard on getting our first um, Chelsea boot. We've done it a couple times and it was never right. But the one we have coming out at the end of this year is just beautiful. Like it's the one like sample that when it finally came in after a couple of rounds um i just was so excited i looked at it i was like we finally did it we finally have our version of the of the chelsea boot it fits well looks great it's beautiful um and i'm not a traditionally a chelsea uh fan i'm, I'm super excited about that coming out uh, as well wow i believe it any uh any wing tips coming down the line <laughs> Not any wing tips per se. We've got, I think, three shoes we have briefed in next year yeah. that I'm really excited about uh, kind of a, expanding off that kind of assortment. And then we've played around a little bit with some of the wing tip boots and kind of that broguing, right? That the kind of the, the broguing on the front and stuff like that. So still kind of experimenting a little bit that we've got to figure out how to make the helm twist on some of those really traditional looks and feels, right? When we came out with our first loafer, we went, we approached it of like, how do you make a cool modern loafer? That's not like your traditional penny. Right. And we came up with the Wilson and it's, it's beautiful and it's selling like crazy, which is fantastic. So we've, yeah. we have these kind of ideas of these projects. We just got to figure out how to like modernize them and, and put the helm twist on them and not just do what everybody does. And, you know, people sell a lot of, these so let's do our you know let's do one too but we've got to really figure out what the perspective is that we want to have on it first definitely and i i'm looking at your loafer now that is a beautiful loafer i love that it doesn't have the strip across the vamp yeah. for the for the penny piece yeah. it does have two strips coming down the quarter yeah that really oh it looks so beautiful especially with your iconic white midsole there oh that is one sharp loafer that is we do have a, a new burgundy color that we've developed Oh. absolutely beautiful so you'll see the burgundy first in that shoe and then you'll see a burgundy in the zen that's if you like the kind of a little bit of untraditional like you talk about like a high shine like deep rich burgundy of like traditional like dress shoes but in like a cool boot like we've got that coming out here in the next month which is, which is awesome 
yeah burgundy is the king of leather colors so <laughs> i'll be looking forward to that drop that's for sure that is so cool i, I was researching your interview with boot spy recently that was a really good one from back in april so that was really informative I wanted to make sure I didn't ask any, cover any of the same ground he did. So <laughs> I wanted to sort of. At, at the end of the day, I like, I, it's, it's fun to talk about boots with people that are passionate about boots and people that are passionate about leather. And, you know, I learn a little bit more about it. Um, and I'm certainly not the expert, you know, when it comes to, to making boots and everything leather and stuff like that. So it's always fun to just kind of listen to other people as well and, and what you're passionate about and what you're interested in. And so thanks for having me on. This has been super fun and, uh, yeah, definitely love, love to continue the relationship and, uh, yeah, like let me know that. how, how those boots do and look and feel, you know, in 30 days, 60 days. Definitely. I will. And I have a pair of your side zips on the way. I'm super, oh, cool. super great, great. Super excited for those. I think they might even be due to arrive today or tomorrow. So I cannot wait for those. Those are, I never thought I could pull off side zips. So th this will be my first pair. But when I saw your guys, I think you guys really nail it with design really well. I mean, thank you. you're doing something different. And that's the way to stand out in this industry is not doing something the best because the best is subjective, but doing it different. That's the key to success, I think. And, and you guys are definitely... You have really sharp designs. They're simple, but they're different enough to stand out. And I love that. So, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thanks so much again, Brad, for coming on with me today. This has been an excellent talk, sir. And uh, yeah, I look forward to talking with you again sometime in the future. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Stay in touch. Absolutely. Will do. Thanks, brother. All right. Bye.